issues. We know we, there are a lot of things going on with the school board. What, you know, yeah. I want you to tell us, what's the most significant issue facing the board right now? I think it would have to be our, the superintendent search, um, hiring the, the, the person that's going to lead us um, right now and through the next number of years um, with our schools and our students is critically important. And, and you know that we, we suspended our search, um, and I think we are now in a place where we're going to have to go back to the drawing board and figure some things out. But we have a good person in place now, and Dr. Krisnar. Um, but I think it's going to be really important that we find the, the right leader for right now. Okay, so, you know, people want to know, you know, why, what is the rationale behind suspending the search? Uh, we talked about this a little bit on Friday's program. Yeah. Um, why do you think it makes sense to do so now? instead of following the timeline that you had previously? Yeah, I think it's, it's really important as one of the largest school districts in the state and the country that we get a robust pool to choose from. So uh, if you think about last time we did a search when Dr. Green was, was selected, we had 70 applications. This time we had 10 um, at the end of the day. And even in those 10, there was probably about three or four that met the minimum qualifications being 25,000, like work and leadership of 25,000 plus students. So at the end of the day, I think we owe it to our community to make sure we have a robust pool to be able to compare and contrast. I don't think it's an indictment on the people that were qualified, I think, but you have to be able to compare them to somebody who's either in the role of a superintendent and be able to look at them uh, fairly. What's going to be different about the second time around? I think timing is going to be important. Uh, we're going to be right now, and, and I think we knew this uh, when Dr. Green left out. Like at the end of the day, at the period she left, we knew we were going to be in a place where we... We were going to be middle of the year during a search, and we, we knew this could be an issue. So once you get to the end of the year, we'll have a bigger pool. Uh, folks who are dedicated to their school or their school environment aren't going to leave in the middle of the year. Um, sometimes they will, but it has to be that special person. So we'll get a better pool then. We'll also know a little bit more about these school board elections. At the end of the day, we as the school board are the ones who hire and fire or, or, or keep that superintendent. So right now there are four seats, maybe six, depending mm -hmm. on if, if there's some – some other action happening and we'll know a little bit more about who's running in those seats and, and what that will look like. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one more point on this, maybe people believe that the points you just made were obvious during the initial search. Like, right. you know, you, you probably knew the, the board probably knew coming in that you're going to be hiring someone you know, in the middle of the school year. Right. Uh, and it would be difficult for you know, a lot of qualified people to apply, especially in a situation where they're under the sunshine. Um, any reason, expect a reason why, an explanation why that didn't occur, that thought process didn't occur early on. Yeah, we had those conversations for sure. We 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 sat around the, that table and really discussed like, should we go now or should we wait? But we we also thought we wanted to get the process started. So in, in our opinion, if we would have had a pool of 30, 40 and really had some folks who uh, we saw a robust pool, we would have moved forward. But I think it's, I don't think I I don't really see a huge issue because. Because I, I'd rather us take a step back, get the right person in that seat, and then must move forward. Okay. All right. So we have a caller. Let's see if we can get David on the west side. On the west side. All right, yes. David. Is that, did I get him? There you go. All right, David, Hello? you're on air. Good morning. Hey, how are you today, sir? Great. What's your question? So I'm actually a neurodevelopmental pediatrician with the University of Florida here in town. Wow. And I chose my specialty because of reading disabilities. My question is, if up to 20% of children have a genetically inherited reading disability, which drives their families down socioeconomic strata over time, is there going to be a structured, formal, system-wide attack to help these kids obtain functional reading by the time they're in fourth grade? Because right now my experience is it's a hit or miss uh, school independent uh, process, not a system-wide plan. Thank you all. I'll take that offline. Thank you for that question, David. Yeah, I think it's a great question. I think literacy is a huge focus of not only here in Duval County, but across the country. Uh, you, you saw even a more decline during COVID. And I think we have a number of resources that we're putting in place, whether it's uh, extra tutoring, extra staff to, mm -hmm. to, to lean in and intervene. But we're also leaning on some technology and innovation, too. And I'm sure Dave knows about this. You have now have AI programs that can listen to a student read and understand what that student's comprehending and sort of have that conversation with the student. So I think we have to have any and every approach. And it is going to be a robust approach, not only from the school district, mm -hmm. but you also have Reed Jacks, who's also leaning in and ensuring that, hey, this is a wraparound. Because it's not just what you're learning in those four walls of schools. It's what's that vocabulary that a young person's learning at home and after school and, and before school. So it's going to be a community effort. 
but it is a huge focus and it's something that once you uh learn to read you can then read to learn and that's something that you have to understand and i appreciate him saying by fourth grade we'd like to have them reading and, and being proficient even before that in second and third grade and i think those are going to be important steps that we need to take okay to david's point uh, i think he wanted to know because he was looking at specific schools where those services were available are they any are there any plans to make them uh, system-wide yeah, I mean, they are system-wide. So every single school has resources for students to be able to read and, and gain the literacy skills that they need. Um, and now more than ever, because of the innovations and in technology that we have, you can see that across all of our schools. And now it's a, a, a moment for us to really take a, a hard look at that and even do more. Okay. We are, we're talking with a school board member, uh, District 4 school board member, uh, Daryl Willey. Uh, you can give us a call and join the conversation, 509-2937. Um, and we've seen a lot of progress from the half cents, half penny sales tax uh, begin to take shape. Yeah. Um, what are some of the key projects in your district that uh, you're proud of and um, that, we, that the public maybe have not seen come online, what yeah. is coming up? or what, How is that going to make it better for students and parents in your district? I think the environment, of course, we all know the environment that you're in, whether it's a work environment, a school environment that you're sitting in is important. Like it, it makes you feel a certain way. It gives you an additional boost of confidence. So we took a, took, a, took a leap of many years back and created that master facilities plan. And there's some great projects going on. And I'll talk about one that's right on the cusp of my area and then my area. Mm -hmm. So the brand new Rutledge Pearson, right. um, our first school that we built with the Half Penny. Um, I just want to thank the voters and all the folks who leaned in and supported that. If you have not been by that school, at least driving by, it is a sight to see. And we hadn't built a new school in that area in decades and decades. So I think that's really important, not only for the, the students that go inside, but the families that have that pride and confidence in the school, teachers that have pride and confidence there as well. So in addition to that, we just broke ground on Jean Rebeau, a Rebault High School. Mm -hmm. That's going to be our first high school built with a half penny, and that'll open in 2025. Mm -hmm. um, what, a, what a site that's going to be as well, right there off Winton Drive, that Moncrief area. So we're really concentrating on areas of town that have been sort of left behind a bit. Um, in addition to that, you have in brand new Highlands Elementary School. I just drove by there. Uh, yesterday. So as the walls are starting to go up at Highlands Elementary School is in that done sort of Turtle Creek area. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to that, you also um, you you have a number of other schools that are getting ready to start being built. So that's that's what you'll see from the outside. But what you may not notice is we also are doing a lot of things inside of our schools, whether right. it's ACs and roofs and also the safety piece, like building those double entries and vestibules and whatnot. So we're excited about the work that's happening there. Our dashboard has all of those pieces in there. And District 4 is going to be better, and our community is going to be better because of it. I've heard a lot about uh, about the Rutledge Pearson. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the makeup of Rutledge Pearson now? Because it was a it was a small elementary school. Yeah. Is it is it is it combined with other previous elementary schools, or what what are those schools? Yeah, but it's combined with Martin Luther King Jr. Elementary School has come on board with them as well. And you're seeing a lot of parents who are making that choice to come over to Rutledge. Mm -hmm. I mean, parents have choice is a whole another issue that we can chat through. Parents have so many options and choices. So you have MLK and Rutledge all together in that school. Um, and wow, like the energy's there, the, the numbers are there, and you're starting to see more and more parents and families buying in to what's going on at Rutledge. Okay. We have a great leader over there too. And, and, re, and Rebalt, same situation. Uh, it, when it's completed, will it be combined or will it be still the same or Rebalt? Still the same. It will be not combined. It'll be Rebalt High School, and they have some good enrollment. They're starting to see even more and more enrollment coming into the school, and we have had to have conversations about what the number of seats we wanted to put in there because there's a lot of interest in Rebalt. Mm -hmm. It goes on leadership, it goes on culture, and some of the programs that are going on in those schools. What's included in the new schools, uh, a, a plan for the ones that, are, that are, have been constructed yet? Uh, what's included in the new schools that, that people can say that weren't in the old schools? Yeah. So give me some of the you know, some of the shiny objects that, that are there now that, uh, that the community can be proud of. Yeah, number one is just the space. Like if you if you go into any of the classrooms, you have a space that's conducive to modern learning. You'll probably have a brand new smart, uh, smart wall that you have. You'll have desks that can rotate and move for small group activities. Uh, you'll the flow of traffic that through the hallways will be much better. Uh, the cafeterias and sort of auditoriums, those will be state of the art. So students will be able to not only eat lunch in there, but also put on a play or a show. Um, also, it's, an, it's set up in a way where community can also access the space, where the, the gym and sort of the cafetorium is set up, where community can come access those spaces as well. So those are just a few of the pieces. And once you, once you walk into these schools, you start to realize what you should have had a long time ago. Okay, let's um, take a caller. Yep. Good morning. Uh, you're on First Coast Connect. Yes. Is this 
Are you talking to me? I sure am, Miss Susan. Oh, great. My question is, um, if parents send their kids to charter schools, how will that affect the master facilities plan? I was listening in yeah. on a school board workshop, and I felt like Joyce, school board member Joyce and Carney were saying they wanted to change the master facility plan that we voted on. And, and um, if you could clarify that a little bit, if more kids go to charter schools, how much is that going to hurt our funding of our neighborhood schools. And also, can you advocate for making the dashboard clear on how the charter schools are spending our sales surtax money? Because I find it very confusing. And even when the um, that charter school asked for $1.4 million from the city council, they, the lobbyists that asked for the money didn't even know how they spent our sales tax money. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for that, Susan. Susan. Yeah. So the the first question, I think we're we're we are going to have to have some conversations about what the master's facilities plan looks like currently versus what it looked like before COVID five years ago. So to our to our point, um, those conversations are going to be coming up very soon because at the end of the day, enrollment has changed. Like mm-hmm. enrollment has changed. Uh, folks are choosing different options for for their school, whether it's homeschool, whether it's using new, the new vouchers that you now have, whether it's charter schools. So that does affect it because a, a prorater percentage of those funds that come in for the half penny do go to our charter schools. So that will affect our bottom line on what and how many schools we can build. So so how, currently, it, just in your, I know you probably, you don't have the numbers in front right. of you, but how has uh, charter school enrollment impacted traditional school enrollment over since I mean, COVID? Yeah, since COVID, um, charter school enrollment has gone up a bit. I think mm-hmm. before COVID, you started to see a spike a bit there too. But now you're seeing a lot more of the homeschool, a lot more of the folks using vouchers as well. So if you take that that full pie and you break that down, um, we're we're going to be in a different spot. We're going to be a little lower than we were pre-COVID. So when you have that conversation, we now have to say, all right, what? How do we prioritize which projects moving forward? And we knew we were going to have to do this when we went into it. You can't make a plan and think that plan is going to be going to stick for 15 years. You want to try, but you need to go back every three, four, or five years. And that's what we said at the very onset. We're going to come back every five years, look at enrollment, look at projects, look where growth is happening. Because growth's happening in different areas of town, too, now that may not have been growing when we started with this master's facility. So the conventional, uh, for a lot of people in the community, the conventional conversation is that um, the expansion of choice school, charter schools, has a negative resource impact on traditional public schools. Uh, You know, how do you make up for the money that's lost, in no cases, with with the arguments being made? How do you make up for the resources that are being lost to charter schools i don't know if you make up for them necessarily but i think the way that it's structurally set up right now is Mm -hmm. that the money then follows that kid so they would say like all right well you have enough money because you have the money that's allocated for you based on the number of students you have so i think that 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 system has always been flawed because it doesn't include sort of economies of scale Mm -hmm. um so i think it's not necessarily going to make it up but i think the way that we're going to have to have the conversation is tough conversations being transparent about which 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 products do we prioritize and which neighborhoods are we going to prioritize as we move forward? So our hope is to maintain as much of that master's facilities plan as possible, but we also have to be mindful of taxpayer dollars. Mm-hmm. Um, and the way that we're set up, if, if we have either declining enrollment or flat enrollment in different places, it's not the same as, as the charter school environment and some of the other environments where you can just build. We have to look at the whole entire county. Um, and I think that's what sets us apart and is a little different for us. Mm-hmm. So in, in that argument, you know, when people are making a comparison between the charters and the traditional public school, yeah. there, you know, there is the element of um, of uh, profit in the charter school system, it can correct? Be. And 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 in doing so, there are other ways for charter schools to raise money and, and or infuse money into their into their process, right, right? into them to their business model. What other ways are there for traditional public schools for them to infuse additional cash into their in their model, business model? I mean, outside well, I, of selling cookies and, <laughs> and, and uh, well, from a from a structural standpoint, is the half penny sales tax. I mean, mm-hmm. that's one way that we went out and did it, or a one mil. Mm-hmm. Like that's you saw us go for those two pieces because those are the ways that a that a traditional public sort of school or school district is able to do that. Right. Um, so we're we're able to see some of those things, and I think that one of the things that we we're going to be faced with and a new superintendent and this board is going to be faced with is how do you navigate in this environment where there's it's ultra choice right. there's so much choice from every family and there's kids that 
we're also responsible as a board member. I'm responsible for those kids in District Four who are going to not only traditional publics, but also those charter schools as well. Like there's a there's a responsibility that I have. So there has to be a balance. And I, we've been in this phase of competition for so long with our charters, um, but now with some of the the regulation and and the, and the vouchers coming from Tallahassee, I think we actually may be uh, more closely aligned, and we can actually fight together to say, hey, how do we figure out some of these regulations? Because we, we have to figure out this landscape and we have to have more communication between each other because at the end of the day, um, right now, we can't be just two, two pathways not uh, crossing over. All right. So let's talk a little bit about some of those challenges with yep. uh, dealing with some of the policies that are coming from Tallahassee. Um, you know, you all were challenged uh, earlier this year, or beginning of the school year with uh, dealing with the reading materials, the books uh, yep. based upon policies um, from Tallahassee. Uh, how do you see that going forward? Do you feel like there is a, a way for for students to be to have clear access to um, a healthy choice of uh, reading materials in their libraries or in their lesson plans uh, that doesn't conflict with the way the state um, sort of uh, you know brings down policy in terms of how what can be what can and cannot be um, made available to students? It's a balancing act. I think there are. Some, some materials there. I wish it was more. Uh, I mean, I think I'm, in my opinion, as me as a board member, I think uh, it, we talk about parent choice and parents should be able to choose if there's a book that's in a library, they should be able to choose that. We do have materials that are available um, for, our, for our kids and for our teachers. Um, right now, what we did as a, as a district, we, we decided if there's going to be a law, we're going to pr- protect the teachers. Right. And we say we're going to make sure that they're uh, we're going to do everything we can to protect teachers from from any um, consequences that could happen. And I think now we're we're getting to the place where we're getting all of these books checked out by media specialists. And and that was the big issue. Like, how do you you have these rules and regulations, but you don't have enough staff to be able to actually take care and look at these books? So I think there are materials there. I wish there were more. And I'm going to keep pushing um, to make sure that there's more and there's more access to that. But I think we as Duval County were were are actually one of the the groups that actually. We did push a little bit more, and we actually had more materials, especially around African American history and, and whatnot, than a lot of districts did. Um, we're one of the eleven who actually were were noted for some of the work that we're doing around that. So I think we were a little bit more further advanced than some of our other districts. But I think that's even more of a reason for us to be a model as we move forward. Mm-hmm. So we got a few minutes left. Uh, I want to talk now about the rubber meeting the road. Yeah. Um, the actual, you know, learning materials for students you know how students are doing yeah uh, we want to see progress in the district in yeah. terms of what stu- students are learning and how they are progressing uh what is it that the district is doing and to to really sort of get there help students get there yeah uh and to become proficient at on their grade levels and beyond it's a couple of things number one i think when you go into a school especially in these days is you have to have to make sure the basic needs of every kid is met mm-hmm. like i think you have kids who are coming to school at and number one, we're going to make sure they're fed. So you got a meal in the morning, meal in the, in the, for lunch as well uh, to make sure that those basic needs that's taken off the table. We've also done a really good job of making sure they have access to resources and technology. So those one-to-one devices, making sure kids have access to that so there's no excuses around those pieces. Um, we've also used some of those ESSER or COVID dollars to really provide additional resources to many of our schools, um, especially schools that, that had that slide during COVID. And we're going to be able to use some of those resources for the next year or so. So and in addition to that, we're really setting up the stage for our students to have pathways. That's what this is really about, making sure our students who are matriculating through our system have pathways. So if you go to any of our, our high schools right now, you'll see not only the AP and the dual enrollment in early college, but you also see CTE or career technical education sort of pathways in every single high school, whether it's IT, whether it's cybersecurity, whether it's gaming, whether it's nursing, whether it's the Star Business Academy to really connect to actual jobs on the back end. And I think that's what's different about today's education. Uh, the jobs are different than, than when you and I came out of school. So now we have to make sure we're educating based on what those jobs are. And I think we're doing a good job at that. And I think we have to not, not only attack it from that high school level, but of course, as you mentioned, make sure we're attacking that literacy like Dave mentioned earlier, because once you learn and have that foundation, it's easier to build upon that each and every year. So we have those resources, we have those uh, the staff to be able to do it. And now it's a matter of, really just having, um, doing that to, to, to fruition and making sure we're actually hitting that nail on the head. Okay. I don't want you to get out here before talking about no. teachers. Yeah. Right. Love they're, our they're, teachers. They're the backbone of yeah. making all of this work. Um, I think the community knows that the, the teachers are funded from the state level. Correct. Correct. 
what is it that you can do locally to help support teachers and and trying to recruit and and attract and and retain teachers uh, for the long haul? Yeah. I mean, one of the things we did, we went for the one mil, and that was to sort of raise teacher salaries. We were able to get teachers uh, some additional bump in their salary. Um, it's, but it's never, never enough. Like the job that teachers do, it's, I mean, uh, you can go down the list of the things that a teacher does. So we're going to continue to try to advocate for more money. But in addition to that, trying to create the culture environment where they want to come, they want to stay, they want to be retained. So whether that's taking some of the administration or regulations away, uh, whether that's making sure that the leaders of our schools have what they need to do to sort of take care of our teachers, or whether that's even from a testing perspective. A lot of our teachers are, uh, you have to take a test every number of years or you have to pass tests. So we're also working with the state to make sure uh, we, we look at what those requirements are to make sure our teachers uh, that are doing an amazing job in our classroom don't have that sort of hovering over their heads. So there's a number of things we are doing, a number of things we're going to continue to do to make sure. And it, it takes the community. Like if you see a teacher, make sure you thank them. Um, we also, if you're sending a kid to school, make sure you're, you're sending that kid to school in a way where that teacher is going to be able to, they're going to be a canvas for learning. Um, so it's, there's a responsibility for all of us to make sure we're doing all we can because our teachers have a very tough job. Um, and the folks know that after COVID, parents know exactly what that looks like. And I think also that the, one of the main factors affecting us right now is, is absenteeism. Mm -hmm. So making sure kids are in school. Mm -hmm. So if we can have our kids in school, that they're going to be able to learn from our amazing teachers that we have in Duval County. What's your vision real quick? What's your vision for your district? Uh, that we have every single resource that we need. You'll see new buildings pop up uh, that will have all the staff that we need and students are learning at high, high levels and have every single choice and opportunity to walk through any door that they want once they finish in our K-12 system here. Okay, all right. Darrell Willie. I appreciate it. Do all kind of school board, District 4. Thank you for joining us this Anytime, morning. every time. All right. Go Dogs. <laughs>